This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. My name is Rick Saar and I'm the Dean and the Head of the School of Law here at the University of South Australia. I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge first and foremost the land we meet on tonight is Ghana land. We express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Ghana people have with their traditional land. It gives me, on behalf of our school and the Prime Ministerial Centre, great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to hear Sally Rugg deliver the Nelson Mandela Lecture for 2019. Sally is one of Australia's leading activists and tonight will take us behind the scenes to show us that ordinary people can be empowered to do extraordinary things. But before I introduce Sally formally, let me just make some other remarks. I'd like to take the opportunity first and foremost to thank and acknowledge the work of Jacinta Thompson, the Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, who gives her apologies here tonight and the team at the Prime Ministerial Centre for the work they've put together in making this event possible. The Nelson Mandela Lecture Series is jointly presented by them and our school, established in 2008 to honour the life and times of Nelson Mandela, who was indeed the Hawke Centre's international patron from 2001 until his death in late 2013. This could have been the 12th lecture, but in fact, I see we missed a couple back in the early days. So in fact, tonight is the 10th uh, lecture in that series. The purpose of the series is to promote the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals and the value of truth and reconciliation in life and in public affairs. The ideal of justice for common humanity underpins all the lectures that we present. Uh, there are a number of delightful people here tonight, namely all of you, a number of my staff, at least a dozen of them. I've made a note of who is here and who is not. <laughs> but I'd especially like to welcome Pauline Carr, who is the Chancellor of the University of South Australia. The session tonight is being recorded. So as we are filming, please switch your phones to silent if you haven't already done that. But feel free to join the Twitter conversation using the links I'm assured are being shown on the screen behind me. Yes, they are there. Ever notice when people say, would you like to tweet? They always go, tweet? They raise their eyebrows. So if you'd like to tweet tonight, <laughs> please do so. One final announcement after the event tonight, straight out in the foyer through which you came, Sally will be signing copies of her book, which is entitled, How Powerful We Are and it is published by Hashett and distributed tonight by the Matilda Bookstore for $32.99. Let me warn you, however, that if you are paying in cash, it'll be rounded up <laughs> to $33. So, time for the speak introduction. My great pleasure is to introduce you tonight to Sally Rugg, an LGBTIQ rights activist, writer and public speaker currently Executive Director at political activist group Change.org, previously the Campaign Director at GetUp, which some of you will know was recently given a lot more publicity by our current PM. Uh, at GetUp, she led the campaign for marriage equality for five years. In fact, that's the story that she tells in the book. She was awarded the 2017 Smack of the Year. I had to go to the website to see what Smack of the Year is. The Sydney Music, Arts and Culture Award. Uh, at the Radio FBI Awards, Harper's Bazaar have called her a Woman of the Year. Cosmopolitan Magazine tells us in, in their regard she is one of Australia's most influential LGBTIQ people and Amnesty International have listed her among the top 15 women championing human rights today. Please join me in welcoming Sally Rugg as she delivers the 2019 lecture. <laughs> Thanks so much for that introduction, Rick. 
Um, and I want to echo um, your acknowledgement of country um, and thank you for giving it. Um, so a lot of yes voters in the room. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. It's a real delight to be here. I was um, mentioning earlier that I think the only times I've come to Adelaide have been um, for marriage equality, which isn't to say I don't want to come back. It's just that I always get drawn um, here. So it's a, it's a real treat to be here again. Um, I don't know about you, but I have never walked away from a public lecture and thought, the speech was okay, but the PowerPoint was amazing. <laughs> um, and that's not something you will walk away saying either tonight. <laughs> the PowerPoint's fine, it's just, you know, it's not very fancy. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk tonight about power. I'm going to talk a little bit about the marriage equality campaign as a case study, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my sort of theories around activism. Um, but first, I um, I just wanted to talk a little a little bit about this um, because I think it would be a bit disingenuous and weird for me to stand up uh, in front of you all today and talk about power. Um, and how decisions are made in this country and, um, you know, big national social movements and not talk about this family who are right now, um, well, they're locked up on Christmas Island in isolation, in detention, um, and they also have become the centre of this um, storm of, of media and, and political commentary um, and incredible activism. Um, I mean, I'm sure we all know the story of this family. Um, they were um, ripped from their home in the middle of the night by border force about 18 months ago now um, and put into detention um, where they have remained. And I, I'm fortunate enough, I suppose it's a funny word, but so I, um, I don't know this family, but I have been uh, honoured to sort of support in a very small way the Biloela community who's working on this campaign. Um, the reason being because they came and started a petition on change.org as the sort of petition element of their campaign. And their campaign is multifaceted, but because of this, th that little touch point, um, I have been privileged to work with many people in the community um, and, and witness this extraordinary um, social movement. Uh, we don't know the answer. We don't know what's going to happen to this family. Um, the court ruled today that uh, they will rule again on Friday. Um, but the reality is, is there's not a legal solution to this campaign. I keep calling it a campaign. But, you know, to, the, to this, um, this crisis, um, there's only ministerial intervention. Um, and I think it's also really important to note that across Australia, there are thousands of people just like Priya and Nades and their two daughters who have been um, settled in our community but could face deportation back to danger at any point um, because of the way they sought asylum in this country. Um, yeah, so I, d I just wanted to mention that, I suppose, and put it at the front of your mind as I continue to talk about power and activism and, you know, keep that there. Um, but, uh, so tonight I'm going to tell you a story about, um, it's a story that you already know in a lot of ways, like the, the, the end of the story is that we changed the law and got marriage equality, um, <laughs> spoiler, um, but I, I want to sort of talk about it in a way that maybe you haven't thought about before, um, and I want to talk about how it wasn't people like me who achieved marriage equality. Sometimes I get introduced to sort of like, she was so instrumental in the campaign and like, I worked on it for a long time, but perhaps that's not indicative of anything because we didn't win for, you know, we didn't win until the end. <laughs> um, I think describing anyone as instrumental of, uh, in the marriage equality campaign is also a bit weird because it was such a group effort by so many tens of thousands of people and so sure there were really valuable contrib contributions but you know I wasn't I wasn't replaceable I wasn't irreplaceable I should say um, <laughs> um, and so 
I will talk about the survey just briefly, but um, I'm not here tonight to talk about the survey and, and that Yes campaign. I'm here to talk about um, a more zoomed out sense of what we did together as an Australian community when we changed the law and passed marriage equality. And my hope is that when you walk out of this auditorium and you're thinking, the slides weren't that great, um, you are also thinking um, perhaps with a new or a renewed um, sense of the power that you have as an individual and how that is magnified you know, a million fold when we all work together. Um, I want you to leave um, feeling like you're powerful and feeling inspired to use that power. That's the goal. Um, so I called my book How Powerful We Are um, because that concept of power is something um, I really wanted people to understand in relation to themselves. But to, to get a sense of how powerful we are, we, um, we need to truly understand how power works in this country more broadly. This is, a, this is my pictorial representation of power. Um, there are some big institutions in this country um, that are really powerful. Um, they are things like the media, um, the judiciary and the police force, big business, the church, um, and parliament. Um, and, and these massive institutions of power, um, you know, they, they don't like to have their power challenged necessarily. Um, but I, I'm gonna, we're going to focus on parliament tonight because that was um, where most of the campaign took place. Um, and to do that, we're going to briefly revisit high school civics lessons. Now, I'm sure most of you already know this, but we just, so we're just going to whip through it. Um, so Australian, Australia's political system is a representative democracy. Um, so what that means is neighbourhoods of people are grouped together um, into electorates, and those electorates nominate a person, and that person takes note of the electorate's concerns, priorities, feelings, all the rest of it. Um, and then though that person goes and represents the community's interests in Parliament where laws are made. Um, there's 150 MPs, there's 76 senators, so each of us, depending on where we live, have sort of anywhere between three and 12 people representing us in the House and the Senate. Um, and because MPs and senators um, who are debating and passing laws are elected by the people, it's their responsibility to do as the majority of their constituents would wish. And to do the opposite would, uh, in effect, mean risking their jobs because the literal role of our elected representatives is to accurately represent the people in their electorate. Right? <laughs> so I'm, of course, kidding. <laughs> That's not how a democracy works in Australia. <laughs> This is a stand-up show now, <laughs> surprise. Um, no, that is, that is sort of like ideally how it would work, but that is in practice not how our democracy works uh, in Australia. And there's a few factors that bust up our democracy. Um, and I do write about it at, uh, like in excess in my book, but I wanted to sort of touch on a few. Um, and, and one is this, one is this idea of political factions. Um, so of these, um, of these 150 MPs and senators and stuff, they, they each belong to a political party, most of them, unless you're an independent uh, MP, sort of like Andrew Wilkie, the member for Clark. Um, and so, as you can imagine, these MPs and senators are loyal to their political party, which has an agenda and a set of values, and you would hope a strategy to implement both. Um, and so that's your MP's team, uh, and you'd hope that when you vote for your MP, you know what team they're on, um, and you have an expectation of what they're going to deliver based on what their team is on. But it's not as simple as that, because within these political parties, there are smaller teams, um, and these are political factions. Um, sometimes political factions within parties differ on small things, like who their favourite former Prime Minister is. 
Um, but then sometimes the differences between these factions are really big things like whether climate change is real um, or indeed uh, whether same-sex marriage should be legalised or not. Um, and so these political factions, like if you talk to a politician, they are likely to tell you that nah, they're not in a faction. Factions, that's overblown. It's not really. I mean, the Labor Party are an exception. They, I mean, they don't love talking about factions, but it's all publicly available. You can join one if you want. Um, but if you talk to the Liberal Party or the Greens, they'll, they'll tell you, no, 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 there's no factions. That's, you know, they don't like talking about it. Um, but they exist, and they, they have funny names, like the Black Hand. Um, that's the moderate liberal faction. Uh, <laughs> and these factions have extraordinary power. Um, they control pre-selection in your electorates, and so if you're pre-selected as a candidate and you're an MP, you might feel inclined to be more loyal to that faction who has your pre-selection uh, held ransom than you are, say, to the majority of your constituents. Um, I, I could go on about factions, but it, it's really um, crucial to understanding that level of detail when we look at why marriage equality took so long to pass. Um, we didn't get marriage equality in 2012, even though we were governed by um, an unmarried, feminist, childless, atheist, progressive woman. Um, not because she didn't believe in marriage equality, although she would like us to think that it was, she was like, oh, it's patriarchal, so I'm not going to do it. Sure, Julia. Um, but the reason why in 2012 the majority of the Labor Party um, still opposed marriage equality was because of a factional power play within the right faction of their, their party that was... Um, predominantly made up by the SDA union, you know, political... Um, and then again in 2015 through 17, the reason why Malcolm Turnbull couldn't legislate for marriage equality is because he was bound by his right faction um, within the Liberal Party who said, OK, well, well, we'll give you the prime ministership, but you're not, <laughs> you're not legislating marriage equality. And so the stranglehold that political factions have on our democracy... Um, it's kind of behind the scenes, but it is present every single day in our parliaments. Um, the other thing that busts up our democracy is money. Um, I didn't really understand just how present um, corporations were until in our parliament. Um, oh, the one before was Survivor, though they were alliances. Did we get that? Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Until I was in the thick of working in Parliament on the marriage campaign, I didn't understand just how present the, the big business was. Like, Parliament sits for about 60 days a year, um, and big business groups host dinners and functions most nights that Parliament is sitting to wine and dine policymakers. And then staff from these corporations, they're on first-name basis with you know, our politicians, and they walk the halls of parliament as lobbyists. Um, they have all access passes hanging around their neck and they just sort of cruise in and out uh, of these closed door meetings. Um, so that, that's um, the presence of the people, but also the presence of the money. Like, in theory, we would all donate to a political party that... Um, you know, we wanted to give a leg up in the election, so we give them a few more resources to do so because we want to increase their chances of uh, winning a seat. But when it comes to big corporations, they're far more likely to give equal donations to two different... Well, to the two major parties. Um, so, for example... ANZ Banking Group Limited, one of the major four banks, um, gave an identical $100,000 in registered political donations to um, Labor and Liberal Party in the 2017-18 uh, to 18 financial year. Um, and I'm not a mathematician, but I feel like it doesn't give one side an advantage over the other if you give them the same amount of money. Um, but they do it to... The, these companies do it to get access. Um, and there was, a, there was a Senate Select Committee on uh, Political Donations recently, very powerful Senate <laughs> committee, um, 
And so uh, the Minerals Council of Australia admitted to this Senate Select Committee um, that they make these political donations, and I'll quote, because they provide additional opportunities for the MCA to meet with members of parliament to lobby politicians on the policy priorities of the MCA. Um, Nine Entertainment Co., the ones who just held a fundraiser for the Liberal Party um, two nights ago, told the committee that their donations gave them access to big business forums of both the major parties to provide informative policy bri briefings. Um, so there are rules that specify who can donate to polit political parties and how much, which I won't go into, but um, do trust me that they're tokenistic and they're very easy, easy to get around. For instance, if you are hosting an event and tickets to the event cost $10,000, no one is checking the event to see if that person who bought a ticket actually attended. You know what I mean? Um, take Sam Dastiari, for example. I don't know if uh, those of us who are following the New South Wales um, Labor Party donation scandal, the $100,000 is in an Aldi bag. Um, former Senator Sam Dastiari um, told the, the inquiry that it was really silly that they put the money in a, an Aldi bag because you could just donate it to the federal party and get around that law. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the complex and covert money funneling between trusts and associated entities and in-kind contributions and off-the-shelf shell companies into the coffers of political parties um, would, would require hours. Um, but I want to impress on everyone here um, that these highly, dona highly complicated donation systems are created um, and remain untouched because they are mutually beneficial for um, uh, like political parties and the super rich. Um, rich people and rich business want to use their money to uh, influence uh, politics and uh, political parties seem more than happy to sell that to them. Um, and the last thing that uh, corrupts our democracy, just so we get a full sense of the, of the power landscape that we are up against, um, is the media. Uh, so, if, um, if every politician uh, was truly held to account by the media, we probably wouldn't see stuff like this. Um, yeah, we, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here and give a lecture on the Murdoch press, but institutions uh, with power, like media empires, do not like to have their power pushed or questioned. Um, and we all know what happens when an individual or a movement crosses the media. Um, they uh, will intimidate people into silence. Um, so that's our power landscape in, in short. Um, and I wanted to quickly talk about that feeling of despair that maybe some of us are feeling now, but certainly I'm sure many of us feel frequently. Like, um, it is the feeling that there is so much wrong with the world and there is nothing that you can do about it. Um, but I want you to know that that feeling is not there accidentally. Um, people in power want you to feel like you can't challenge them. The institutions of power I just talked about, the media, um, big business, the parliament, they want you to feel powerless before them. Um, they want to silence you, essentially. Governments want to subdue you into a quiet panic until you cast a vote in their favour in the hope that they will help you. And I I know that that might sound a little bit conspiratorial, um, which I'm fine with, but I just wanted to add that some examples of that um, are, for instance, our defamation laws that pretty much only power, uh, protect really powerful people who have the money to pursue defamation cases. Um, there is... Uh, from, from the government, there is intimidation and suppression of in investigative journalism, uh, like the raids um, done on investigative journalists. Um, 
the refusal to release information about onshore matters or grant visas to journalists who want to go to Manus or Nauru. Um, the, the patterns of photo disenfranchisement, um, such as when the AEC up until uh, so nine years ago gave you 24 hours to register to vote um, once an election had been called. Like you just had to quickly do it, otherwise you weren't allowed to vote or change your address. Um, the new protest laws that are being brought in state by state that make it impossible for activists to take to the streets. Um, and of course, crackdowns um, on organisations like Get Up Where I Used to Work, the union movement and civil society more broadly. Um, so that feeling of despair, that's not because you are inherently um, like pessimistic. That, that, is, that is put there. Um, <laughs> because institutions that are in power don't like to have their power challenged, They'll put all this structural stuff in place, um, but they also want you to believe that activism is for losers. Um, they, uh, they don't, just like they don't like minorities, um, they don't like activists. Um, and in conservative and tabloid media, for example, or from uh, politicians who are annoyed at activists, um, we are caricatured as hysterical or constantly outraged, or smelly barefoot hippies, or poorly educated attention seekers. Um, and so through this characterization, we, the activists, we're all activists now, um, we are characterized as the villain. And this is something that I saw time and time and again through the marriage campaign, particularly during the survey. Yes, campaigners were suddenly bullies. Like, we didn't want to have a public vote, but then when we had to campaign for it, we were, we were ramming our message down people's throats. Very weird. Um, and this, this um, characterization of anybody who pushes power to be um, a smelly, useless loser um, is more than just, like, turning current affairs into juicy stories, but I think it's a deliberate strategy that seeks to undermine and dismiss activists' work. Um, and th these institutions of power, they work together in cahoots, which is why you see, for instance, part of the, you know, parts of the Murdoch media empire um, defend Catholic priests who are convicted of child abuse um, who are like really good friends with the Prime Minister um, who, and that, that government gives tax breaks to the Murdoch media empire who put up front pages like that. I know it seems conspiratorial, but um, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's correct. Um, and in, in this um, condemnation of activism, we also hear things like clicktivism and slacktivism. You know, like, your activism is useless. It's, it, it's not going to have any impact, like armchair clicktivists. Um, but if we're being uh, ineffective one day, the next day we're being too disruptive. You know, like you're inconveniencing everybody and you're too disruptive. Um, the next day we are doing more harm than good. A lot of people being like, I've never done activism, but I think you are doing your campaign more harm than good. You know, they really um, tr try to undermine the work that we do, and it's, and it's deliberate. Um, so what is activism? Just quickly, um, activism is about changing things that those in power don't want changed. Um, it doesn't have to be adversarial. Um, you know, it, it can be blockading a street and shutting down traffic, or it can be organising a meeting with your MP and having a polite conversation. Um, so it doesn't need to be adversarial, but in its culmination, it does need to make power bend and relent. Um, it needs to displace privilege, even if that privilege is just um, an unchallenged ability to make decisions for other people. Um, and I think it needs to be the external force in Newton's first law of motion. Um, so it will change the course of something that would have otherwise just continued on forever. Um, 
Every campaign, we're activists now, so we have to learn a little bit of strategy. Um, every campaign that we do theory of change, and a theory of change looks a little bit like this. Um, it captures the precise cause and effect that your cause and effect that your campaign is trying to achieve. Um, it describes how that external force will change the course of your existing power. Um, this is how you can tell if a campaign is real or not. So, for instance, a, a something that's like sign the petition to stop global warming. That is not a theory of change because why would signing one petition stop global warming. Um, there's no realistic cause and effect with that idea. I'm not saying petitions are bad, like I, you know, I do petitions for work. Um, but uh, the theory, theories of change are developed um, thinking about the concepts of if and then in a more complex sense. So for example, like if enough shareholders pressure the, the company's board, then the bank will withdraw its funding from the mining project. Like, that, that is a really watertight theory of change. Um, if we can raise $15,000, then we can put ads all over Sky News, uh, which is the TV ch channel that politicians have on in their office. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, if an LGBTIQ couple in every electorate meets with their MP this month, then politicians will return to Parliament with their stories front of mind. Um, does that make sense, that theory of change? Great. Um, so there's, really, there's heaps and heaps of different types of activism, but in a social movement like marriage equality, all of the activism is connected, serving different purposes at different times. Um, like I said, it can range, activism can range from sending an email to your MP um, or climbing up a tree and living in the tree for 10 years to stop it from being cutting, cut down. Um, sometimes it's marching in a protest, sometimes it's blow, blowing the whistle on um, dodgy practices that your employer is undertaking. But still, people love to tell you that you're doing your activism wrong. Um, they will tell you uh, that your activism is too disruptive and it's uncomfortable and they don't like it. And so, um, going back to that critique of activism, I wanted to talk briefly... Uh, oh, hold on. So, yeah, the, the if and then, if and then. Your campaign is bound together by a theory of change, if and then, if and then. But it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. Um, this, is the, this is the complex mess of activism. Um, uh, it's, yeah, no one kind of activism will pull off uh, a huge uh, sort of like society shifting change like marriage equality and all activism is worthwhile. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about um, this idea of disruption because people love to tell you that your, your, your campaign is doing more harm than good. Um, because marriage equality now is seen as like almost boring because it's so accepted. Um, it, like I said, a lot of yes voters in the room and so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point over the last five years or so, well, seven years or so, we'd have said, oh, I don't understand why they won't just get on with it. Like, what's the big deal? Get on with it. Um, and that's great, but... 50 years ago, um, it was a really different story for LGBTIQ people. We, um, we were hunted by the police who would come and break up um, gathering, public gatherings of predominantly gay men um, and beat us up. Um, and that was allowed. That was, um, you know, condoned. Um, homosexuality was still criminal across Australia. Um, the, the last state to decriminalise homosexuality was in 1996 um, and the punishment remained 14 years in prison or a court-ordered lobotomy, um, right? Um, and so now our LGBTIQ rights movement um, looks a little bit like this, <laughs> but the first sort of, the first big uh, LGBTI 
rights um, activism was a protest. This is a photo of the first Mardi Gras, the Sydney Mardi Gras, um, which happened in 1978 when a group of LGBTIQ um, activists got together um, to protest police brutality on their community. Um, and they, it started as uh, like a fun parade. They wanted to keep the tone really positive, so they like decked out a ute with speakers and rainbows and had a dance party down the street. Um, and after about half an hour, the police descended on them, even though they had a permit. Um, and uh, what happened next is now described as a riot. Um, I won't go into all the gory details, but um, there were dozens of men who were arrested and thrown into the jail cells, and the activists waiting outside all night could hear them being beaten. They could hear their screams and cries from inside the cell. Um, and these people are still around. Um, this was in 1978. Uh, so uh, the origins of marriage equality, I mean, th these activists couldn't dream of getting married. Like, they just wanted the police to stop beating them up. And, and the lesbians wanted um, the courts to stop taking their children away from them. Um, and I imagine that trans people um, were probably just hoping that it would be, be safe to come out at some point. Um, but now it looks like this. Um, and this. And this. This is the Liberal Party marching at Mardi Gras <laughs> in 2018. They had big signs that said, the Liberals achieved marriage equality, which went down a treat, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> And I, I should say, like, the Labor Party... Bill Shorten went to the 2016 election saying marriage equality was going to be the first thing he did if he won the prime ministership. Um, but they... I mean, they opposed marriage equality in, uh, you know, 2012. Like, it, yeah. So... I'm just, yeah, I'm just trying to say, like, it, it seems really fine now, but it didn't... It wasn't fine at the beginning. Um... I'm just going to race through this. So we had to run a campaign that was up against this mass, these massive institutions of power where we were being cast, we as activists, this is all of us, we all voted yes, so it's all of us. Um, we were being cast as bullies or as layabouts or as, you know, daft idiots, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so we had to think about what institutions of power care about. Um, we know that corporations care about money. We know that the judiciary care about law, sort of like in an obsessive way, which is understandable. Um, if I knew what the institutionalised church cared about, I would tell you. <laughs> because it doesn't seem to be the systematic abuse of children. Um, or their brand. Um, I suspect... I suspect, um, considering Cardinal Pell's uh, attempts to um, put the Ellis defence in place here in Australia, that it is also money. Um, and politicians care about votes. Um, but they don't, they don't care about all votes, they care about some votes. I'm pretty interested in their own votes, but like, they assume that they've got them. Um, they don't care about their opponents' votes. It is not useful for Greens voters to shout at liberal politicians that they're never going to vote for them. They're like, yeah, I know. Um, uh, but uh, they, they care about the sort of like 50 plus one thing. Like they want their own team and then they want enough to win their seats. Um, so, like I said, we're not talking about the survey, but I want to talk more broadly, and so I'm going to take you back to 2015. Um, and this is sort of broadly what we were up against. Um, we've got, like, Kevin, Cycling Buddies, Andrew. Um, you remember the Cycling Buddies thing, right? Erica Betts, um, sort of, like, noted homophobe. Uh, and Tony Abbott, obviously, the most conservative prime minister in a generation. Um, but what we had was 62% of people who already supported marriage equality. Um, and activism is about using the power that you have in an organised way in collaboration with other people. Um, so to push our politicians to act on marriage equality broadly in 2015, um, we needed to transform this 62% of um, 
the public support into political pressure. Um, and so with the goal of um, allowing LGBTIQ people to marry, um, our theory of change was um, if we publicise this impatient 62% and show hard evidence of political cost to individual government MPs, um, then the Liberal Party as a whole um, would uh, consider holding a free vote in Parliament. That's obviously not what happened. Um, and so we had this 62%, and then we also had um, what those 62%, you know, what that number represented, and that was people. And as individual people, this is the power that, this is some of the power that we have. I mean, there's heaps more, but um, we have our voice. Any one of us at any time can use our voice to call our MP, um, to call your talkback radio show, to write a letter to the editor, to have a conversation with your friends, to post something on Facebook. Um, we can use that voice. Um, we have our time. Uh, you can volunteer. You can, um, uh, in your community, you can uh, take political action on the phones. You can go door knocking, all this sort of stuff. You have your money, really important. Um, and so there's various things you can do with your money, um, ranging from ethical consumption, which is a bit of a scam, but that's, I left it up there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just really into like massive collective action rather than individual choices, but I digress. Um, so it ranges from, you know, like your keep cup right the way through um, coordinated divestment campaigns. Um, and we can use our body, we can, um, we can show up to marches, we can um, buy a ticket to a plane and get on the plane and refuse to sit down while uh, the government is going to deport a family. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so the campaign we were running uh, was what we call a target-centred campaign. So we had one decision maker or like a, a decision-making body and the campaign involved um, collectively organising massive amounts of people with all of this power to exert their pressure upwards. I already told you that. This is some of the stuff we did um, in, that, in, the, in 2015, but before the survey. So there were um, localised actions, phone calls, uh, contact asks, polling, all the rest of it. So demonstrating political cost to inaction on marriage equality. I'm going to come back to that. Um, old mate. Um, and then before we knew it, it was August and the plan was working um, because Tony Abbott was forced into a six-hour-long party room meeting to figure out how the hell he was going to deal with this impatient 62% of people who are using their, their time, their voice, and their money, and their body. Um, and he emerged from that meeting, and he announced the plebiscite. And so, obviously, this is not where our story ends. We are very powerful, but we do not have unbridled power. Part of being an activist is knowing that you will lose so many times along the way. Um, but, I mean, you can read more in my book about this party room meeting and how it um, was the beginning of the end for Tony Abbott as Prime Minister. Um, it was the, that six-hour party room meeting um, that set the wheels in motion for his disposal. Um, and so, so we didn't win there, but the coalition were forced to come up with a plan how to deal with marriage equality. In 2016, we... Um, convinced the Labor Party to block the plebiscite. Fantastic. Here's Peter Dutton. Um, and he gets an honourable mention because um, the coalition could have just said, great, the LGBTIQ community don't want to have a plebiscite on marriage equality. Guess we won't, guess we won't do marriage equality then. Um, because they were the ones who didn't want to hold it, right? We saw what we were up against. These are people who didn't want to legalise marriage equality. But by that stage in our campaign, we, the impatient 62%, had convinced this government that unless they dealt with marriage equality, that they would pay for it at the next election. We had demonstrated the electoral cost so um, greatly that old mate Peter Dutton 
came up with the idea of the postal survey and spruced it to his own party room because he was trying to figure out a way um, to get the thing done. Um, in my book, I talk about a campaign pivot, but we're not going to talk about it now because we're running out of time. Um, and Tony Abbott's back here again because I want to read you something that he said in 2019 before his election, before the, the, the Warringah election. He said, when all is said and done, I helped to make the thing happen. This is talking about marriage equality. <laughs> I helped to make the thing happen. I set up the process which opened up the possibility and even the likelihood of change. Now that it has happened, I absolutely accept the outcome. It's the law of the land, and that's the way it is. Now, to demonstrate political cost, which was this campaign's theory of change, um, you have to communicate political, political reward. Um, if we are convincing politicians that inaction on marriage equality will be um, extremely harmful, harmful to them at the ballot box, like, ipso facto, we are communicating them to them that marriage equality is super beneficial for you and your campaign and your brand. Um, and so, can we really be surprised when politicians turn around and try to use our work for their own benefit? I suppose we can't be. But... Um, this is kind... Not Tony Abbott, but this is kind of why I wrote my book because um, as, as the marriage equality law was being passed through the House of Representatives, I watched in real time the story of how we got there be rewritten. And I watched, not Abbott at that stage, but I watched Malcolm Turnbull and members of the Liberal Party um, say that they had achieved marriage equality by a postal survey. Um, which isn't what happened. And now this isn't about taking credit and it's not about glory, but I, I just watched the government pave over our years of work so that they could perform a victory lap. Um, and I think that it matters because if we have our work paved over, if we have our theories of change um, and the incredible breadth and depth of the work that we pulled off as a community paved over, it means that we can't do it again. And I think we really need to do it again um, because there's so much left to achieve in this, in this country. And so that's why I wrote the book, because I wanted to capture the really smart and amazing things we did um, and all the mistakes we made, um, all the bits that I found um, sort of like rock really rocked me to my core, I suppose, that the moments I felt like I compromised my ethics or that to make political change in this country, um, you know, you can't be pure anymore. And I, I wanted to capture that so that people could get a really clear insight of what happened so we can do it again. And I just, I know that I'm at time. Oh, and one, I've got one minute. Um, and I just... Oh, and so, talking of political benefit, like, this was the division on marriage equality. Um, and I remember, not all of them, because some of them arrived in Parliament supporting marriage equality, but I remember, like, half of them, each time that these MPs came out and declared their support for marriage equality, because the majority of them who weren't elected in 2013 or 2016 came to Parliament opposing it. Um, and not only did they all vote for it, but I mean, I'm sure we were all there. We witnessed these politicians make, making marriage equality like their big brand um, thing. And you know, that, that's the campaign we ran. Some gay people. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER But I want to go back here um, just before we finish. Um, because I talked at the top about, like, maybe we'll leave here feeling a little bit inspired. Um, and so I do want you to feel inspired and think about this, ca the, this family and also the families just like these people all around Australia. But I want to also look at what has been happening this last week. 
because you might have seen in the last few days this rush to discredit the activists who are helping this family. Um, like, and th this isn't about ego, like, uh, uh, nobody, on the, nobody working on the campaign cares that they're, like, embarrassed in the media, but stories like this act to discourage people from speaking out and speaking up and joining the campaign and, and taking action. Um, and um, I talked about making power bend and relent, that we've got to push these massive institutions of power. On Monday morning, the Home Affairs Minister, Peter Dutton, wrote an op-ed addressing this campaign. When has that happened? Um, you know, he's, he's taken out a column to explain why he's still saying no on the campaign. Um, on the same day, the Prime Minister released um, figures and footage about um, asylum seeker boats that have been coming since the election, um, which clearly, like, I'm not sure how us publicising the campaign over the last week has led to boats coming six weeks ago. Like, the timelines don't seem to add up. But um, this is extraordinary. This is, this is power being pushed and power fighting back and trying to stop, stop us. Um, and I just wanted to mention it because um, Gandhi says it much better than I do, but, but I... <laughs> obviously, um, but I see this pattern again and again and again, which is first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And we might, this family might not remain in Australia on Friday, that is the reality of the situation. Um, and so, I mean, calling it winning is a bit crude, but like we might not win on Friday, but I think something that extraordinary that has happened with this campaign is for the first time in a very long time, the Labor Party seems to have a really weird message. They're like, we want no people who come here by boat can settle in Australia, except for this family who haven't legally been declared as refugees, um, which is another story, I'm not going into that. But I, I think that this campaign has been a bit of a lightning point and has disrupted this bipartisan cruelty. Um, and what I am hoping is that, um, well, I'm hoping this family can remain in Australia, but I'm also hoping that um, Australia taking this family into their hearts um, can continue to have their heart op opened and fight for the rest of the families um, who also just want to stay here in their communities. Um, if you want to, you can buy my book. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you, Sally. Before we go to questions, I worry about the ability of uh, conservative columnists to spell. I'm sure they meant tin-eared activists, so... Uh, <laughs> We'll come back to that later. Okay, it's your turn. We have about 15 minutes of questions. I, I see people with hands in the air immediately, so we'll go to the young lady in the red jumper. Now, there's a microphone coming, so please wait for that. Hi, Sally. Thank you for that talk. It was really very inspiring. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned, and I've been participating as an activist for many a years, um, campaigns do take a long time. How do you deal with, and you do face a lot of setbacks and that, how do you deal with activism exhaustion? Um, I mean, the short answer is not very well. Um, I get sick a lot. Um, like, I get, I get a recurring chest infection. Like, I run myself down a lot, so that's the first answer. Um, and the second is that the, I think the one of the best things about activism is that you're working with a bunch of other people. And um, so if you need, if you're exhausted, other activists understand that and will tap in and out for each other. Um, but also like, I find, I find activism really inspiring. So even when I'm feeling that despair, I, um, 
I'm so lucky to look at the, the people around me who on that day aren't feeling despair, I suppose. Um, yeah, the, the best thing about it, one of the best things about activism is the community. And so I think it's the community that keep me up, particularly the LGBTIQ community. Like, I'm so lucky to be gay. Um, <laughs> if you've got it in you, like, I really recommend giving it a, <laughs> giving it a go. <laughs> yeah. Looking for a second hand here. I see the young man in the pink shirt. Everyone's young tonight. <laughs> young activists. Thank you very much. Turn this on. Ooh. We'll just check that um, volume, can we? Hello. That's better. Social media, Sally. Um, on the one hand, it's given um, a great platform to ordinary people. On the other hand, the uh, behemoths especially Facebook and Twitter, have eroded the, um, uh, the business model of, of um, media mm. um, and eroded um, journalism jobs and so forth. And, and I don't know whether there's a line to draw to how weak the ABC's got with their investigations, apart from Four Corners and Background Briefing, but their news and current affairs is a, a pale imitation of what it was. So on balance, has social media helped the social uh, the, helped the progressive cause or or not? It's a big question. Um, I mean, the short answer I think is yes, because I think um, allowing more people to participate in the public conversation um, and you know providing people touch points to influence decisions that are made about their lives. I think that's incredible. Um, but yeah, the, the, the state of the media is, I mean, it's a crisis. And my sense is that maybe it will shake out okay as the market responds. But I mean, like, there are, um, there are some, you know, like the Washington Post, for instance, in the US, like, have sort of, like, come out the other end and are now on a sustainable revenue model and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I really hope that media organisations are going to be able to adapt in that way. But, yeah, right now, um, it's shocking. Yeah. And, and I, you know, that is in part social media's fault. In the I see part. the hand up there with the young uh, woman with the, uh, the ponytail. Um, I was just wondering what your opinion is of activism in schools and how you think if that should be regulated or not and whether politicians should be speaking up about it. I think activism in schools is great. Um, yeah, I, I, like, I was going to say particularly around um, you know, the inclusion of marginalised communities. I'm really fortunate to... Um, be invited to speak at schools sometimes for sort of wear at Purple Day or various um, LGBTIQ inclusion um, efforts. And I know that, like, when schools um, are, you know, take practical measures to make sure that LGBTIQ students are safe and included, it largely comes from the students um, and a little bit the parents as well. Um, and like activism with schools doesn't need to be like, we're gonna make the entire school carbon neutral. Like that'd be cool, but um, it can be something small like, um, you know, we're gonna have a gender neutral bathroom available or, um, you know, we've got, we're gonna um, sign, a, you know, sign a pledge for zero policy, to, uh, zero tolerance to racism and these are the values that represents and sort of pushing that into a, uh, a lexicon within the school. So yeah, I think it's fantastic. And the school strike for climate, oh my gosh. Are you going to strike on the 20th? I strike for climate change. Fantastic. <laughs> Very good. I told, I told my, my team at change.org that they had to strike on the 20th and they were like, it's not cool if you tell us to do that. Like, we're meant to <laughs> do it without you. <laughs> okay, we'll take Samantha over here with the... Uh Dark hair. You didn't say young. You forgot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the young, the young uh, Samantha over here. 
Um, thank you, Sally, for that talk. That was wonderful. My 16-year-old daughter was supposed to be here tonight and she's going to be devastated that she wasn't. I'm going to make sure she watches it on the website. Um, furthering on from the comments that we just had about activism in schools, she is incredibly passionate about activism. What is your advice for a 16-year-old wanting to make a change? Uh, where does she start? You know, it, it's, it's one thing to, to share something on social media, but when I go home tonight and I tell her, look, I, I had this wonderful speech and this is what you have to do, what should I tell her, Sally? <laughs> she should buy my book. No. <laughs> um, she should request it at her library. Um, uh, I think... Like, the cool thing about activism is that it's been around for a really long time and that there's heaps and heaps and heaps of people doing it already. Um, and a lot of the lessons have already been learnt and refined um, and all the rest of it. And so my advice would be, to, like, whatever activism she's interested in, um, is to find out um, a little bit of the history of it um, because, because it's cool. Um, and also, um, chances are there's already people in her area, if she wants to do it physically, or um, people online who have the same values and the same interests. So she likely won't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but yeah, find, finding out who's doing what already and, and where that history is. Okay, the young woman with there's the red... There's one up there oh, as well. I hear what Okay. We'll, we'll take three questions probably to finish. Young okay. woman in red sleeves, young man in the middle here, and then young person with the glasses over here, and then the young man down the front here. That'll be our last four. Here we go. <laughs> um, great talk. Um, my question is being formed as I open my mouth, so hope, hopefully it comes out making sense. Where are sense. you? Oh, you're up there. Sorry. <laughs> um, a lot of the... So I'm on Twitter and things like that, and a lot of the causes, people are really passionate about a cause... And um, it's great to support a number of causes, but I, I guess I'm thinking on a more big picture mm. level, there are so many things happening and so many of them are, are terrible and horrific. And I'm coming from the perspective of Australia being, we, we used to think of ourselves as being the lucky country. And that narrative is often in the rebuttal to these causes. You think it's bad here, you should go somewhere else. And that mm. always irritates me, as if we have to be aiming for the lowest common denominator instead of something better. And I guess I wanted your view on bigger picture activism about let's aim... Instead of let's, comp let's try and challenge the things that are going badly, putting forward a positive uh, vision for how we want things to be. Yeah, totally. I mean... The first thing I'll say is um, you've just sort of summed up what is known as whataboutarism. So, you know, like we're f fighting for something and I say, well, what about that? Um, and people who employ um, whataboutarism tend to not people who are, be people who are actually making change. They're not people who are like, well, what about this cause that I'm working on? People say that to undermine your work. Um, and to demean it and to say it's not good enough, so stop. Um, it's really easy to spot what about Um uh, And in terms of, like, a big positive um, thing, I mean, I think a lot of... Well, I mean, activism is necessarily underpinned by a big-picture positive um, vision because if we didn't have that positive vision, then we wouldn't know what was wrong. Um, and so the thing that sort of came to my mind when you were speaking of big picture vision, um, and I do write about this a little bit in the book with support of some of my um, friends who are First Nations academics and activists, um, is when I think, I mean, I didn't go into the postal survey, the big yes campaign, it's a decentralised peer-to-peer get out the vote campaign. But when I think about the work that was done there and the lessons that were learnt there, um, and the, the values of allyship and solidarity that underpinned the Yes campaign. Um, I think about uh, First Nations people's fight for sovereignty um, and ultimately a treaty. And so to, to envision and to imagine a society where First Nations people um, you know, have the sovereignty of their land fully recognised and have self-determination and justice. Um, to dream that is a big positive vision, um, but to get there, we, 
you know, have to confront all the things that are wrong um, in a day-to-day -day sense. And also, you know, the colonial um, racist past that Australia was built on. Um, so, so I, I think the sort of positive vision um, is always coupled with this is what's wrong. Um, but the inverse is that this is what's wrong is always coupled with a, a vision to, to do better and be better. Okay, we do have time for these last three questions. Oh, sorry. One, two, three. Away we go. So staying with the big picture, um, when you've got money against you as well as um, inertia or the way we do things around here, and I'm thinking particularly around big money, um, the way the economic system's built around fossil fuels, um, what degree of extra push is needed when you've got the, the big dollars and the entrenched way of doing things against you as well? I mean, how do you see that working out when it comes to climate change in particular? And yeah, I mean, I, sh I should start by acknowledging that there are so many people who are experts in climate change campaigning, and I'm, like, I have worked on climate change campaigning for a while, but not in a leading role, just in supporting roles. Um, I mean, the good news about that is that uh, like renewable energy in industries is already cheaper. So like if we're talking about um, money, like it'll sort itself out. Probably not in time though. Um, <laughs> this is positive and negative. Um, but I mean, the, the, the strategies that the climate uh, the climate justice movement employ at the moment is around um, policies and regulation through parliaments because that is... Um, where we can have the most impact as electors. But there's also some really cool um, divestment campaigns. For instance, the one I sort of briefly touched on um, in the slideshow and I write about in my book was how um, the, div the divestment campaign targeting the major banks in Australia that saw them pull funding from the Adani coal mine. So there are ways around it, but it, it's not easy. And that is why... Um, the sort of like the good, the good 12 years that we have left feels very frightening. Hi Sally, love your work. Um, during the months of the postal vote campaign, um, I found that in talking with my friends and family, the prevailing mindset was I don't care. And I had to reiterate multiple times, I am queer and non-binary and this affects me personally, so why don't you care? Um, what would you suggest activists do to work around that kind of apathy people mm. seem to have towards causes of social justice? Mm. First of all, I'm so sorry that that happened. That sounds really... It sucked. Yeah. Um, I mean, the consolation is it's clear that a lot of people did care um, in the end, um, and I, I hope that that has kind of found its way in a little bit as well. Um, it's funny, like the campaign for marriage equality and other campaigns like this, Bilawila campaign and other ones, really rely on personal story. Um, and um, sort of certainly for queer people, like mainstreaming our identities, um, you know, like opening up the most intimate parts of ourselves and our families and our identities um, and, and sort of trying to p twist us into a shape where we look just like everybody else so that the majority might see their humanity reflected in ours. Um, and so as a tactical campaigner, I would say, you know, sharing your personal story. Um, but like as a friend to friend, I would say, don't worry about it and just keep yourself safe. And you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to campaign your friends and family. You just got to keep yourself safe, particularly in things like the Postal Survey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sally, and all the people who've come and the people who make all these things happen. It's two things, from little things, big things grow. And the other is, much of what you seem to be suggesting is it's tactical, as you said, targeted and operational. Mm. So it's, I don't want to use the word military, but I think there's a Chinese fellow that said, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So can you sort of sum up, just comment? Sum up how it's sort of a military... Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. But I, I do sort of touch on this theme a little bit in my book because 
Um, I write about how in the survey in particular, when every single person in the country had a vote on our lives, essentially, about how the campaign broadly, um, certainly sort of like the centralised, organised, salaried campaign th that I was part of, and it wasn't just, you know, there was different organisations, but I was part of that. Um, we used tactics that we, you know, like the tactics we used were different because it felt like a war than we would have used in times of peace. So an example I'll give is that we had um, data and res re like reams of research that said mentioning safe schools would hemorrhage yes votes. You mustn't mention safe schools because you'll, you'll lose yes votes. And it was, you know, we were really frightened we might lose this vote. And so during the campaign, people like me didn't mention safe schools because we mustn't. Um, and then, but the, the, con the consequence of that is that all the misinformation about safe schools was able to spread into the community and take residence in people's hearts and minds. And I, I don't know if we can repair that in the short term. And so in times of peace, that is not a tactic we would have employed. We would have continued to talk about how safe schools is at worst innocuous and at best saves lives. Um, but we didn't. Um, and so, yeah, it, it felt like a war. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the people who are able to get married now won it. And I think Australia as a whole broadly won it because I think we are a fairer and more inclusive society. But um, the, the people who were damaged by the decisions that were made during the, the campaign in order to win probably don't feel like winners. Very good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it falls to me to just make some concluding remarks and to offer uh, a vote of thanks. Uh, so thank you very much, Sally, for the wonderful speech. And yes, the slides were wonderful as well. <laughs> thank you. Sally is a, a true champion on the struggles required for people of goodwill to bring about social change by challenging the status quo when it no longer meets our expectations. Now, a few weeks ago, I mentioned the topic of tonight's talk and the fact that Sally was going to be talking tonight uh, with a friend. And the friend uh, wasn't aware of who Sally was, knew nothing about the marriage equality connection with her, so I mentioned something about her formerly being associated with GetUp. And the comment from the friend was, ah, an agitator. <laughs> now, this term uh, resonates with me and will probably resonate with most of the lawyers in the room tonight. It's a term referred to by the late, great former Attorney General of Australia and then later High Court Justice Lionel Murphy in a somewhat infamous case. Uh, I should add that I was a, a law student back in the 1970s and the time when the High Court used to come to town, I dutifully went down to the Supreme Court to watch the High Court sitting. Lionel Murphy was the only High Court judge who didn't wear a judicial wig and the only High Court judge with a female tip staff. He was quite the iconoclastic chap. But I digress. Uh, in 1982, the High Court had a case come before it. The case was Neil versus the Queen. Mr. Neal was chairman of a Northern Queensland Aboriginal Council and he'd been convicted of assault, namely spitting on the manager of the local store, a non-Indigenous man, during a fairly heated debate uh, and uh, claim and counterclaim in relation to allegations of racism. So, uh, so Mr. Neal was convicted and indeed he was sentenced, would you believe, to two months imprisonment for spitting. On appeal to the Queensland, Queensland Court of Criminal Appeal, uh, the sentence was increased to six months. <laughs> so Mr. Uh, Mr. Neal appealed to the High Court, uh, which actually, as you can probably predict, uh, allowed the appeal. Uh, in his judgment, Lionel Murphy, who was one of the judges, referred to the magistrate's characterization of Mr. Neal as, quote, an agitator. And here's what Justice Murphy said in his remarks. Quote, if he is an agitator, he is in good company. 
Many of the great religious and political figures of history have been agitators, and human progress owes much to the efforts of these and the many who are unknown. As Oscar Wilde aptly pointed out, quote, Agitators are a set of interfering, meddling people who come down to some perfectly contented class of the community and sow the seeds of discontent amongst them. That is the reason why agitators are so absolutely necessary. Without them in our incomplete state, there would be no advance towards civilization. End of quote. Justice Murphy then ended that paragraph with the somewhat infamous words, Mr. Neal is entitled to be an agitator. Indeed, they made a, uh, a documentary about Lionel Murphy some years later, and in fact, that was the title of the, uh, of the documentary, Mr. Neal is entitled to be an agitator. So Justice Murphy was an agitator. Nelson Mandela was an agitator. So Sally Rugg, too, is in very good company. <laughs> Not only is she entitled to be an agitator, she has a duty to be an agitator like all of us. Indeed, she is to be applauded for her agitation. Please join me in thanking you tonight for her agitating remarks. It simply falls to me to make two or three comments by way of housekeeping as Sally moves towards the table to sign books. Uh, first and foremost, a, uh, uh, first and foremost uh, to, uh, to thank Renee Jolly, I should say, from the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, who provided me with all of my notes tonight. <laughs> to remind you that the video will be available on the Hawke Centre website sometime next week and also to get your books on the way out. Once again, thank you all for coming out tonight. We look forward to the next time we have the Nelson Mandela Lecture.